grace has been given us and better appreciation of that grace has been made has been made manifest to us in these latter days for in previous times where the fear of the Lord may have been a cause for us to turn to God in holy reverence or in some type of response to terrors feeling as though we would not want to be cast into hell or be removed from the opportunity to find heaven then previous generations were able to teach and to preach and to reach to the masses the gospel message in ways that probably caused a lot of works and they were good but maybe not as much relationship which might have been bad because a lot of what happened previously when you're saved through love or saved through fear as the Bible says you can be saved through love you know loving God will cause you to choose to want to please him or you could be saved through fear where you don't want to displease him it's always kind of a both will cause the same effect of coming near unto God and in the past it was dependent upon the reality of the relationship that the person that was preaching hellfire and brimstone or the sovereignty or the integrity of God and the holiness and the, the level with which we needed to attain in order to have that salvation given us often brought people to kind of a holiness that might have been partially misconstrued and the same thing has become true in the age of grace that we apply ourselves in now before the end of the world has come we have begun to see not just the seeds planted of the abuse of grace but we have seen the complete distortion of the word itself as well as the implied direction that grace could somehow extend to those that God has condemned and man chooses to apply grace and say no salvation will come to them in the end and we find that in the same way that Catholicism had mistaken hell and provided a purgatory for the working there out of some type of salvational experience after death likewise there are those who are teaching now that somehow grace because of God's love has been given so that those who have not chosen God would still find salvation after they die probably one of the hardest things to teach on is grace because when you want to give somebody something that is so wonderful you hope they'll appreciate it it doesn't mean they will but it means that they can do what the scripture describes as trample again the grace they've been given and try to crucify Jesus again on the cross for their sins that they've taken the freedom that should have been theirs in grace that's been given and used it for licentiousness or selfishness or manipulation to a point of placing themselves back under the reality of a God they're serving which can be self-deception to the point of following the evil one and causing a anti-grace almost in direct respect to the anti-Christs that have gone out into the world the anti-spirit so to speak of Christ that have gone out into the world and the anti Messiah who's to come or the anti-prophet in other words we do know that there is that error that we call false whether it be false teaching false doctrine false Messiah false prophet false grace false legalism false faith it's false and so it's tough sometimes to really grasp just how wonderful or how powerful grace can be when you allow he who gave it to us to extend it to us and cause us to understand it in its proper context and that's why we use really Chuck Smith's book on living water to better not just grasp the idea of grace but to make sure we don't fall flat on our face in grace 
mistaking it as a done deal or a purpose that doesn't require that God have some part in it, but that somehow we've somehow taken what was done and made it our own by what we choose to do with our faith, which doesn't apply to grace. Wrong one. I was like, this is the Spirit of God. No wonder there's grace. So having you extend grace to me while I find the right place, we'll find where grace has begun. And we've been going through this series in order to grasp what grace does, what grace is, and how grace applies to us, so that we would not be foolish about some of the things we've learned, but rather we would see, as it were, God moving in the midst of this thing we call grace. Because while it is by grace we are saved, it's really the atonement of Jesus Christ and the fact of what he has done that God imputes to us grace that saves us. It's not grace that we are saved. It's what the action of Jesus Christ has done for us that gives us grace, that saves us because of what he has done. As wonderful as it is, forgiveness is only half the story of the gospel of grace. There are many people who believe God has forgiven us in Jesus. Where they have trouble is the second half of the good news, as though they thought there was only one half to the rest of the story. Paul Harvey used to say, and now you know the rest of the story. And that's why we study grace. Not everybody believes that. Not by a long shot. They figure that they have it. Where they have trouble is the second half of the good news is that just by believing in Jesus Christ, God accounts us righteous by our faith, by our belief in Jesus and what he has done. Not everyone believes that grace is applied by our faith. Various groups have established standards of righteousness that they seldom agree upon what those standards should be, but nevertheless they hold others accountable to a standard that they themselves cannot live by, much less are they able to do on their own. Is gold in or out? Not so very long ago, some groups thought it was unrighteous to wear buttons. They said, you can't wear buttons, button here, button there, button on your underwear. I mean, my wife has some kind of rhyme that says something about, I'll say so, and she says, buttons on your underwear. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> she's from New England, I'm from Southern California. Oh well, she's from Boston, or well not Boston, she's actually from Hyannis, you know, Massachusetts. I'm from Southern California, LA. You're as far apart as you can get, trust me. <laughs> so sometimes, I don't have a clue what she's saying. But at one time, buttons, as you see here, were out. No, you had to have hooks. Everything was hook. And I don't mean, you know, like Peter Pan and Captain Hook or the pirate hook. But, you know, they're little hooks that go on eyelets. They kind of like have these little, kind of little, uh, well, some of them are metal, but sometimes they have like a little loop of hook or circle and they go over a kind of pin or an eye. So hooks and eyes were for their garments and wouldn't think of wearing buttons on anything. You wear buttons, they'd say? How unrighteous can you be? Shame on you. That's evil. Don't you know that that's of the devil? <laughs> Even today there are groups who teach that wearing gold is utterly sinful. Oh, you can't wear gold. That's, that's you know, flaunting riches. No, no, you can't wear that. I'm sorry. Nope. You cannot possibly be righteous if you wear gold. Throughout history, people have established varying standards of righteousness or doing the right thing that they have felt was right or wrong. I hear it all the time, sometimes in holidays. You know, somebody just recently told me, you can't have an Easter egg hunt. I said, well, pardon me, I could if I really wanted to, but the fact is, no, I'd rather go on an Easter egg hunt than have an Easter egg hunt. No offense, I mean, I kind of like it, you know, it's kind of like, go get some eggs. But they were trying to tell me by their standard of righteousness, I had to understand that 
Easter is for Jesus, not the money, honey. You know, I said, well, you know, I understand that during Pesach and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that maybe you didn't know that's what Easter comes from, that Jesus being crucified on the Thursday night, on the Thursday afternoon, you know, on the third day he rose again, you know, and that being on Sunday, and that Good Friday really is a misnomer for what we know that Jesus actually was risen because he had to be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, you know, and that like was, Jonah was in the belly of the whale, and that prophecy had to be fulfilled. So in other words, he had to be died on Thursday. It happened to be that type of Passover that was going on because they had a special Passover that was going on called a Passover Passover. So it's a special occasion, accordingly, that they slaughtered the lambs on Thursday so that it wasn't slaughtered on Friday. So Jesus was accomplished by him being dying and then being put into the grave and being put, rose again on Sunday and that actually we can go ahead and celebrate a sunrise service in the morning and we can have Easter bunnies in the afternoon. You know, I mean, they have a standard that they want me to live by. I told them, hey, I got a standard too. I like eggs. I like bunnies. I think I'll go enjoy my eggs and bunnies in the afternoon and I'll go celebrate Jesus in the morning. You see, it's not compromise. But it's what you do with those Easter egg bunnies and rabbits and Cadbury eggs and baskets, you know, and Easter parades and wearing a bonnet and marching down and walking around. I mean, really, I don't see any idols in decorating eggs and making them look like cute little whatevers, you know, or Peter Cottontail hopping down the bunny trail. I'm sorry, Charlie Brown can't come out of his TV and tell me that somehow I've blown it, you know, and that I'm not going to heaven because I can't meet someone's righteous cause of wanting to get rid of the Easter Bunny. Not me, man. I'm <laughs> sorry. That's a standard of righteousness that doesn't apply to my salvation. It will not trip me up. It will not stumble anyone. It will not fumble in any way unless you're doing an egg toss and then if you fumble it, it breaks. Sorry, that's not what our faith is about. It's not about something as fragile as days of the week or holidays. But rather, our, our salvation is based upon the accomplishment of what Jesus has done and our faith in Him. Throughout history, people established those righteous ideas and they always adhered to them by some standard that they made hoping and thinking that God would accept them after they made application of them to others and even themselves by afflicting themselves at times in ways that were needlessly causing frustration rather than relationship. There is, however, a real problem with trying to establish a righteousness by law or by works. The fact is we rarely live up to even our own standards. We fail where we tell others where to go with what we think they should do. And we don't do the same. Each of us accepts a moral standard that we consider good and right. And that is what I really am. Or, let me say, at least that's what I would be if I were not so hindered by outside influences. Psychologists call it our superego, our ideal self. But we think we are, or we want to be, and what we think we ought to be. Unfortunately, no one knows the real me. Why? Because the real me is perfect. In fact, I don't even know the real me because circumstances constantly keep me from being as wonderful as I really am. I am master of my own destiny. I am captain of my own ship. I did it my way. And you see people that have, and they died miserably, didn't they? Along with the superego, psychologists talk about the ego, which is the real self or the true self. Sadly, the true you is never up to the standards of the ideal you. When you examine superegos and egos, when you realize that you have that capability to want to idealize or make into some format something other than what God is saying, then you'll find that you're playing God, then letting God be in control. Superego and ego will do that more often than not when man wants to justify himself, when man wants to defend himself, 
when man wants to present himself in a better light than what he is. Jesus said, Light has come into the world, but man loved darkness more than the light. Because if man had loved the light, he would have come to the light to reveal what works he was doing and what manner of nature they be. But you see, men already know about the ego. Men already know about the superego. Almost every man knows his own failures and hides them from himself and from the world and does not want to be seen. He knows in himself what his works are. He's not deceived. Adam was not deceived when it came to choosing to follow Eve and to indulge in her sin and rebellion and open rebellion to God. He knew the consequences of his actions. He knew the complete picture of what he was doing without there being any deception about what the perception Eve had. And the reality was that he chose to do it anyways. And man has not suffered from deception since. Likewise, we in our sin know our sin. We know what kind of sinner we are. There is no atheist out there that doesn't know that there is a God. There is no one out there that doesn't have a recognition that they are not perfect. Everyone knows that. And so psychologists, a lot of times, make the mistake of implying as though the integrity of a statement is true, as opposed to the application of the experience of the realization of knowing man inside and out. And that's what God has said. And that's why we can take the word of God over the word of man and find a conclusion that brings us to the necessity of needing something that is outside of ourselves. Someone who can better look at where we are, who we are, what we are, and how we are. Someone that can look at our superego and our ego and say, enough. You have no go because it's all about me. In other words, when Jesus said, deny yourself, you were already lost when it came to your superego, much less your ego. Because the fact is, to follow Jesus, you'll put your superego and your ego on the cross and you'll crucify it. And once it's gone, then you can start to begin to be built up from the ground up from the baby stages because what you think you know you know nothing at all but what you will know is the fullness of grace the realization of mercy the comprehension that his love is everlasting and that walking with God will always involve the grace that you extend to others even as the grace has been extended to you